Hello, a very warm welcome back. It's great to have all of you back with us. And I hope by now that you have also read the chapters of the Bhagavad Gita with us so you can follow the conversation that Sister Denise and I are having about this ancient Indian scripture. Sister Denise and I are now on the second part of chapter 4. And by second part, I mean we didn't get past Shloka 3 on the previous uh, discussion. So we will be looking at the rest of the words within Chapter 4 that are of interest to the reader. Sister Denise, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, I note that the next aspect of the chapter, Chapter 4 specifically, verse 4 reads, Arjuna spoke, your birth was later, the birth of Vivasvat earlier. How should I understand this, that you declared it in the beginning? Uh, and this is my question, Sister Denise, is um, God says to Arjuna, God obviously knows his own births. He also knows that of Arjuna's, but Arjuna is ignorant of his past births. Uh, why is it that uh, human beings reincarnate, but we have no memory of our incarnations? Imagine if we did remember our incarnations, there would be a huge confusion. So it's a kind of safety catch that you arrive clean slate, but you have the sanskaras and of course the karmic accounts from previous births are there. So the more you know about the knowledge of karma, the philosophy of how action, reaction, consequences of karma work, uh, the more you are able to interpret your circumstances in such a way that you can say, well, I understand my situation. So then you wouldn't resent it, you wouldn't uh, try to uh, fight it, you would be much more easily able to accept it. So that's an important thing. God, as I have said before, is not a human being and therefore doesn't need such a safety catch. So God knows who he is at all times, whether in um, the state of an avatar or whether not as an avatar because God is always aware. So when the human being is in the world of nirvana, the soul is as a seed and unaware. We only become aware when we have bodies, whereas God can be aware without a body or using another body in order to communicate to humanity. So God's birth is different from human birth. Then we look at the question of a deity, uh, because what you'll also see is Krishna, Vishnu, Brahma, all of these um, divine um, beings are described in terms of rebirth. When you look at the process of the cycle from Satyuga, Treta Yuga, this is the period of time where there are divine humans, so the deities. God doesn't take birth as a deity. There isn't in the sense that need for it. The need for God is at the time when everything goes really wrong for human beings. So the time of God's incarnation is um, a very important question that's under consideration. Is it the time when the main religions are established? Definitely that would be the belief of the um, founders of the religions or the belief about the founders of religions. And what you find in Hinduism is the idea of the multiple incarnations or avatars of God. So, for example, it will be said that God incarnates as Krishna, incarnates as Vishnu, incarnates as Ram, incarnates as Buddha, and then also there are incarnations of um, uh, forms that are not human forms like that. I like the idea of God coming as a fish or as a crocodile. 
So there are all these legends about these avatars. But here we have Krishna saying that I know your births. And that can only be God. Only God can know the births of the human beings. Only God will know his own births. And it is said in the Sikh scriptures that it doesn't take God very long to transform a human being into a deity. And this is a significant expression because it also uh, tells us that this is one of the things that God does, is to take a basic human being, maybe even a very special one, but nevertheless ordinary human being full of all the vices and everything, and turn him into a deity that is a human being who is an immortal, who is complete with all the virtues, who is um, following the principles of correct life and so on. So that the whole lesson of the Gita is God explaining how he does this. And then in this part about when did you tell this? And can you precede yourself? And so he says, well, you know, I'm mysterious in that way. Now, according to the traditions, Krishna is born in the Copper Age. According to the Brahma Kumaris, Krishna is the first prince of the Golden Age. So there you have quite a large difference. And what the Brahma Kumaris will say is that Krishna the one who is the the prince of the golden age would be in a sense the result of the Gita. So there there would be a difference between that Krishna and the other Krishna. Just as there are several Rams, you know, there's Ram God, there's Ram the um, the king of Trita Yuga, and then Ram is also another name for the soul. So in the same way with the word Krishna, the word Krishna actually means the most attractive one. And that applies to incorporeal God as an epithet. It also is a description of the first prince of the golden age. And so there is sometimes a mixing of which who, who is being talked about. God doesn't take birth and rebirth like people. Mr. Denise, can I interject there? Yeah. What then, I understand what you just said, what does this line mean then? Many of my births, capital M, have passed away. What does that mean then? You know, a human lifespan can go absolute maximum, say 150 years, and the life expectation in many places today will be not more than about 30 or 40. That's for a human birth. Every time the earth reaches a state where everything is collapsing and falling apart, that is the time when God is needed. And so the kalpa is the procession of the ages, the whole cycle. So every time a new cycle comes, uh, God is required to set up the next cycle and enable there to be that perpetual motion of the continuation of the cycles. Otherwise, everything just falls into oblivion. Mm. And so the idea uh, that we have, that's, that's often mentioned, mentioned in the Mayan culture, very much in the Brahma Kumaris, a kalpa, a kalpa will continue for a 5,000 year period, and then it will start again. So one uh, expression is, I come every age, and another one is, I come every kalpa. So we have to see which one we feel to go with. I n now want to ask you about something that I see to be a contradiction, mm -hmm. but which may not be. Uh, verse 6 reads, Although I am birthless and my nature is imperishable, I'm going to stop right there because my question is, uh, many of my births have passed away, and the next shloka speaks of God saying, although I am birthless. I knew in my mind, 
um, you can you cannot have many births and be birthless simultaneously. To me, it's an either or. Um, take me through, uh, lead me out of my own darkness, Sister Denise, because this uh, is, on the face of it, a contradiction. Mm -hmm. In um, what I've what I've learned in uh, Brahma Kumari's Raj Yoga, is that the the supreme being, the supreme soul, uh, we call Shiva. Shiva meaning the one who is Kalyankari, the benefactor, the one who is um, the point, bodiless, incorporeal, um, the one who is the seed of the tree of the world. And so it is said for Shiva, Swayambhu, Swayambhu. And this means that he makes himself get born see, normally when you get born, your parents form an embryo and the soul is drawn to that embryo through its karmic accounts. So you do not make yourself get born, you get pulled into your next birth. Whereas for incorporeal God is Swayambhu. And you will see at the end of the um, shloka number six, I come into being by my own power which is the same idea that I decide to come, I come. But it is said that the birth of God is not like the birth of a human being because God will appear, speak, and go. Um, it's different. It, it's like uh, one, once a human being takes birth, you have to stay in your body. But it is said for God, he doesn't have a body of his own. And so the image of Arjuna and the chariot is a symbol of the idea that incorporeal God can come into another person's body and speak through them. And you also get the similar idea with the uh, spirit of Christ, speaking through the body of Jesus, the spirit of Abraham, speaking through the body of Abraham, uh, the spirit of the Buddha, speaking through um, Gautama, you know. So you have this um, precedent of people being a host to very, very special souls. So these special souls you may call the prophet souls. So there are such extraordinary caliber souls, um, but it is said for God, God is one. In other words, there's not another type of God. There's only one God who is absolutely different from a human soul, and at the same time, the seed of the human tree, the father of all souls, the father of all the religions. And so I think what is being said here is that incorporeal God um, can manifest himself to communicate with humanity if he wants to, uh, by his own power. I, I think this is what we've got here. And then you see the spirit of uh, Krishna, the spirit of Vishnu, who's also called the sustainer, and you have also the Trimurti, Brahma, Vishnu, uh, Shankar. So Vishnu is said to be out of his navel comes Brahma. Out of Brahma's navel on a lotus flower comes Vishnu and then Brahma and then Vishnu. And it continues indefinitely. So Brahma becomes Vishnu, Vishnu becomes Brahma. Now, all of this is quite difficult for people to figure out. And I think part of what incorporeal Shiva is doing is giving the keys to enable people to understand what that means in terms of the birth of the number one soul as compared with the birth of the number zero soul. The Shiva means also zero non-human but very much connected with the humans and uh, Krishna being the most beautiful. Krishna is also called Sham Sundar 
um, the dark and the beautiful. Or Sundar also means fair, the fair and the dark. And here we go into skin color again, uh, where his birth includes his state being absolutely pure and also a state of decline. So this is the state of passing through all the rebirths. So the big question that arises for people is do we start perfect and then decline or do we start um, uh, imperfect and then slowly evolve? So most people go for the evolutionary uh, angle but according to my understanding uh, actually when God creates someone it is the process not of actually making a soul come into existence but of taking a depleted soul, a worn out, simple soul, corrupted soul and transforming that soul and bringing that soul to a state of perfection through the knowledge of the Gita which is why the knowledge of the Gita is so extraordinarily important. Mm. The rest of that particular shloka is um, very powerful. Although I am the Lord of all beings, yet by controlling my own material nature, I come into being by my own power. I come into being by my own power. Well, this is the line that I think refers to, I can incarnate if I want to. What is that word that you used earlier in Hindi? The avatar. No. Swayambhu. Yes. What is the English translation of that? Swayambhu, I get myself born. So, so Denise, what you're saying is that um, it is clear from the uh, pages of this scripture that God is very clear about the fact that he does not take on a human form uh, uh, as, as his own body. As his own body. I do think that taking a human form is what is being said. And I think that also ties in with Krishna the friend. Mm. You see, because Krishna is clearly having a human form. Yes. yes. So, um, uh, and another way of putting my question is that the Supreme Soul, the one who's called the Lord of all beings, mm -hmm. uh, does not take birth through a, a mother, a womb. Right. Okay. But he uses the body of a human being to speak the message. Yeah, so that we call the avatar, the incarnation. So the soul comes straight into an uh, adult body, you see, mm. and then starts talking. If you get born as a baby, you can't start talking right away. Mm. Also in line with what you said in previous um, chapters, uh, you come under the influence of matter if yes. you take birth. Yes. And God cannot come under the influence of matter. Exactly. Yeah. And at the, uh, I think there's one more uh, quite important point in terms of the philosophy of reincarnation. If you take birth and you get sustained by a mother and father and so on, uh, you know, you have to take rebirth according to your karma. So you come into karmic bondage, whereas God is and must remain free because he is the liberator. Sister Denise, I see the next uh, verse is the passage that you already mentioned, which I think is the, you know, one of the most famous quotes of the Gita, so yes. we will pass that. Uh, for the protection of the good and the destruction of evildoers, for the sake of establishing righteousness, I am born in every age. My understanding of what this shloka says is, God says um, when he is born and what his job is, what his vocation is. Mm -hmm. Um, so, would you like to take us through that? I, I um, take it as something a little bit more drastic than that, in a way. I think that we've already talked about uh, when God comes, which is mentioned in many of the religions, um, the result of it is a completely new civilization. Like in, in uh, the Torah, we talk about the New Jerusalem. Uh, in the Mahabharat, which is the 
large epic in which the Gita is contained. In the Mahabharata, you have total tragedy. Everything is lost, everyone dies, the um, bad people go to heaven, the good people go to hell, everything is just too weird as, a, as an ending. And then, all of a sudden, there is flood throughout the world, and the baby Krishna appears on a leaf of a tree, you see. So this is also having a lot of symbolic value, but you can see that there's a sort of discrepancy that the uh, speaker of the Gita is preparing everything for a completely new kalpa, a new cycle, a new age, and then the first leaf of the Golden Age is the baby Krishna. So this is where I see that there are, in a sense, two Krishnas. There's uh, the God, the most attractive one, which can refer, I think, to the incorporeal supreme soul, and then Krishna, the most attractive, the highest number human soul, who, in the form of a deity. This is where we have some some questions, you know. Yes, Denise, the um, next verse um, caused confusion in my mind because um, I understood from the previous chapters uh, differently. So I'd like you to help me with that. He who knows in truth my divine birth and action, having left his body, he is not reborn, not reborn. He comes to me, Arjuna. Now, it is common knowledge that mm, all over the planet, there are human beings who aspire to, um, I believe the word is moksh, mm -hmm. which is eternal liberation, uh, because they do not want to come back to a world of sorrow. Now, they got that aim from this verse. Now, you spoke earlier of reincarnation cycles. How does this fit into that picture? To know God is very difficult. Easy in some ways, very difficult because God is so different from us, mysterious, very often described as unknowable. But yet, the Gita says, no, I can be known and there are people who do know me and who can know me. And those people are absolutely true people, as is described here. Now, when you know God, it means you start listening to God. And when you start listening to God, knowing God, and acting according to what God's instructions are, then you're performing karma, which frees you from the cycle of birth and rebirth of karmic bondages. So at the end of a cycle, you've completed your cycle of births, and you're learning such karma which enables you to return to God. So that is the end of the story. But then God goes on to say that, well, we have a new beginning. So in our Western cultural angle on things, we talk in a linear manner. So the beginning is over here, the end is over here. These two ends are very far from each other. When you look at time cyclically, then the end and the beginning, they touch each other. And it's just a question of jumping from one cycle to another cycle. And this is where we talk about Purushottam Sangam Yuga, which is the, um, the sort of additional age which is superimposed on the cusp of the end of one cycle, the beginning of the next cycle. So I think that um, you know, on one hand, it's the end, you go back to God and that's the end, but then there's a new beginning, it starts again, so you get this alpha, omega expression, you know, in uh, uh, Greek um, philosophy, the alpha, the beginning, the omega, and the end, they come together. Mm -hmm. And these are also said to be uh, letters that refer to you know, God, and of course the Islamic word Allah and the Islamic first letter of the alphabet is Alaf. 
and which means, which is written as a straight line. The devotional person who's thinking about God will raise the index finger and point towards up, indicating that we are earthly souls, human souls, but there's one, this also means one, there's one who's different, and that one is the one who causes everything to be reset. So we can look at it like that. Mm. Okay. Mr. So Denise, we have to say uh, goodbye to you for now. And um, I notice we're going through this particular chapter very slowly, uh, which is fantastic because um, we're um, gaining more in terms of um, our understanding. Thank you for that. So there you go. Mm, what do the various titles of God mean? Um, what God's role is in humanity? Uh, how does God play his part as far as his vocation is concerned? Sister Denise has answered all of these questions and more. And um, you'll note that her, an her answers are very fresh and uh, unusual. So I really thank on your behalf, Sister Denise, for joining us today. And we will see you again soon. Thank you and goodbye.